If you have a copy of Scripture, turn to John chapter 14. That's where we're going to be camped out today. John chapter 14, specifically verses 12 through 14. Let me ask you a question. You know, I like to come out of the box sometimes with a, with a hypothetical, and, and today won't be any different. The question I have for each and every one of you today is if, if you knew that God would answer your specific prayer 100% guaranteed, that if God Almighty, the one who owns it all, would answer your prayer 100% guaranteed, in other words, whatever you requested, what would you pray for? What would you pray for? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for another opportunity to gather as your people. Father, I simply ask that you would open our hearts, you'd open our minds, you'd open our ears, give us a spiritual understanding to share and to understand, Lord, what you would have us to ingest spiritually today, that, Lord, that not only would it be understandable, but, Father, that your spirit, Father, would move in it and we would get it. And, Father, we would not leave it in this room, but, Father, help us to remember and metabolize it and, of great importance, apply it to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why did I just do that? Praying, we know why I prayed, right? But why why did I tack that little part on at the end? And don't look at me so religiously because I listen to your prayers and you do the same thing. Why do you do it? Why do you end your prayers? Why did I just end my prayer? Why do we in the Christian church end our prayers in Jesus' name? (laughs) I like the story of the fellow that uh, he went up in the attic and he sees an old oil lamp. And of course, what do you do with an old oil lamp if you find it in an attic or on a beach? You rub it, and what comes out? A genie! A genie, right. The genie comes out. The genie says, you know, thank you so much. I've been trapped in there forever. And uh, uh, just to show you my gratitude, I, I will grant you how many wishes? Three wishes? And the fellow immediately, his mind goes crazy, and he said, okay, the... The the first wish is this, I want a million dollars. And immediately, a million dollars gets wired into his checking account. How many of you would say, that's pretty cool? I'm happy stopping at one, but the genie is so, so thankful. He says, what's your second wish? The guy says, you know what, I'd like a mansion with two Lamborghinis in the driveway. And immediately this palatial mansion is produced with these two shiny Lamborghinis in the front. Wow. Jeannie reminds him, well, you've got one more. What would you like? Guy thinks about it for a minute and he says, well, I don't know if you know this about me, but I am scared to death of flying. But my favorite place to go to is Hawaii. I love going to Hawaii, specifically to Maui. Man, it is just my, my place to go. I love Hawaii, but I just white-knuckle the entire flight to and from Hawaii. So what I'd like for you to do is with this third wish, I would love for you to, to build a, 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 a highway from, from coastal United States to Hawaii. Well, the genie thinks about it for a minute, and he says, well, well before I... Before I grant that one, let me just kind of tell you, you know, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty challenging one. You know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but, but think about the material costs alone and, and man, the manpower and what that would, that would entail and, and, and material and, and, and labor costs. And, 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 you know, that's a long way, you know, that's a long flight. And, and I, I don't know, could you, can you maybe give me a third option, a third wish? The man says, well, you know, I've been thinking about that one too. He says, I don't know if you knew this about me either, but I've been married several times. And I would love for you, if, if possible, for you to, to, to give me understanding on how a woman thinks. And 
And the genie asked, do you want three lanes or four? <laughs> like a genie, <laughs> like one who is on the hook to, to grant our wishes, does the Lord have to answer anything we ask for in Jesus' name? You know, some, based on our text today, believe that Jesus is, is somehow giving them heaven's platinum card with this carte blanche to request and to receive anything that you want with no restrictions. But, but is that what he's saying in our text today? What did he say? Go to John 14. John 14, beginning with verse 12. Jesus begins by saying, very truly I tell you. Some of you may have a translation, verily, verily, I say unto you. When Jesus said that, Jesus is basically saying, listen up, heads up, ears open, this is important, don't miss this. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do, listen, friends, even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever, everybody say whatever. Everybody make a W right now and say whatever. I, Jesus speaking, remember Jesus is speaking. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for you may ask me for anything. Wow. In my name, and I might do it. Is that what he says? I what? I will do it. Wow. What do we do with that? We have to stop. We kind of have to put it all in context, don't we? Who did he say this to? When did he say this to? them, we know that this discussion, those instructions from the Lord himself happen on the eve of his crucifixion. And as he is meeting with these men who have been followed him, these men that he has hand-selected, these men who have given up everything to follow him, Jesus is doing several things, isn't he, in that infamous upper room. He's already washed feet, he's already done the Lord's Supper, he's already taken this this, this holy, sacred, old covenant meal, and he's retrofitted that to draw attention to who the lamb, the Passover lamb really is, that, that all is being fleshed out and incarnated by Jesus, the lamb of the world. And, and, and he's doing all of these things, but during all of this, he is ministering to them. He is shepherding these men who he loves so devotedly, and he knows they're upset. Why? Jesus is leaving. Jesus is leaving, and they're upset, and, and what's going to happen when, when Jesus leaves? And so Jesus is, is trying to reassure them that, yes, he's leaving, but he's not abandoning any of them. And, and guys, 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 wipe away the tears, because it's good. It's good that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm not just going to leave you guys abandoned. I'm not going to leave you guys as orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when he comes, listen, good things are going to happen. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even, listen, this is the part that messes us up, even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father <sighs> And if you've been reading the rest of the Bible, and if you've been reading the Gospels, you are left with this, huh? Greater? Greater because we've been hanging out with you. And we see that, man, you have authority over, over meteorological elements. You've got You've got authority over broken bodies. You, you speak to dead people, and they get... Up, you're able to provide food from a little boy's lunch. You're, you, it's good. It's good that you, we're, 
we're, we're going to do what you do? We're going to, let me make sure we're hearing you right. We're going to do greater things than you, Jesus? Wow. Because we're really in touch with your power, and we're really in touch with your character, and, and, and I don't know how, and we don't know how you're going to do that. And somehow the Holy Spirit is going to allow this to happen in our lives. It's amazing when we read the rest of the story. Some of you remember the old Paul Harvey radio shows. Paul Harvey had a radio show forever and ever called The Rest of the Story. And, and we're blessed because we get to read the rest of the, spo- the story. And we recognize that what Jesus said was absolutely true. How many of you know that the things that Jesus say are absolutely true? You can count on Jesus. You can count on his promises. And if he says you're going to be able to do greater things than these, then you're going to be able to do greater things than these. And sure enough, we get the ability to read the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is that on the day of Pentecost alone, that more people came to know Jesus than are recorded in any of the travelings of Jesus. We get to read that the fledgling church went out all over the Roman Empire and changed the Roman Empire and changed one of the emperors himself, which changed everything around them, where Jesus never left a geographical landmass. Jesus was right. Jesus was right. As his followers would get the handoff, they would get the ball, they would go forward with the mission of Jesus Christ, and they would accomplish more than just one human being, even a divine human being, in one geographical location. He would, they would do greater things. Jesus was right and was able to do greater things to a a greater degree. We know, we know as New Testament students that those early disciples multiplied the work of Jesus. How did they do it? That multiplication, listen, came through the power of prayer. It came through the power of prayer. What did Jesus say? And I will do whatever you ask. That sounds like prayer to me. How about you? Some of you are saying, man, I'm still learning a lot about the Bible. But that sounds like prayer to me, right? I will do whatever you ask. How? In my name, right? You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And we know Jesus made them on that day, on that night. He made them an offer they could not refuse (laughs) and did not refuse. And as a product, they changed the world. And so what do we do with that? What do we do with that 2,000 years later? What does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus. Is that something that we just kind of tack on in kind of a religious way, yet it's kind of the sign off <laughs> with God? Do we, do we somehow again just kind of tack that on as kind of, okay, this, this forces Jesus' hand. I know he, he's listening, and I'm not even sure if he wants to answer this prayer the way I want him to answer this prayer, but I use the magical words in his name. And so he's on the hook. He's obligated to do that. Interesting. Is that something mechanical? We just kind of tack on in the end? Because according to Jesus in our text here, it sounds like it's more than just some religious sign-off that somehow it should be shaping the contents of our prayers. So let's identify some of these things. Let's first of all identify that What in Jesus mean isn't and doesn't do. If you're taking notes today, and I hope you are, here's the first thing I want you to write in. Is that in Jesus' name isn't a magic formula. It's not fairy dust. It's not bippity boppity boo. (laughs) It's not a a talisman that, that, that unlocks mysterious supernatural forces. It's not a magic charm that as we pray, we rub. It's not a genie's wish. Second of all, is that in Jesus' name, it doesn't obligate him. Some of you are like, oh. I thought because I said those words, 
that it obligates him to kind of do what I would want him to do, to answer the prayers like I would answer the prayers. Listen, in Jesus' name doesn't obligate him. In other words, Jesus is under no obligation, listen, to meet our wants or our whims. Only our needs. Only our needs. If Jesus didn't meet our needs... What kind of reputation would Jesus get? Jesus said, not only is he a shepherd, he is a what kind of shepherd? He is a what? I am the what? Good shepherd. You've had shepherds before. You've had people who've had care over your souls. You've had caregivers. You've had people who've loved on you and, and, and helped you in times of need. I'm, I eclipse those. I am the good shepherd. What would you say about a pet owner who did not feed their pet, who neglected their pet, who was absolutely irresponsive to their pet and, and pet responsibilities and, and pet owner responsibilities? How many of you would have a real problem with that? How many of you would say, man, you, when are you going to feed this thing? This, this pet is in terrible condition. It's skinny. It's, it's mangy. It clearly needs to go to the vet. And, 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 and that would reflect on that pet owner, wouldn't it? Some people would say, you know what, Where, what's the, where's the number to SPCA? What's the number to animal control? I mean, that pet should not be in there. And yet scripture makes, it aware, makes us aware that he is the good shepherd and we are the sheep of his field. We are his lambs, and he takes care of us. He knows your needs. Scripture tells us, he told us, that he knows our needs before we ask for them. So much of the content of our prayers is us. Jesus, I need. Jesus, I need. Jesus, I need. Jesus, take out a legal pad. I need this. I need this. I need this. I'm here at the store. I'm going to need this. Get this. Get this from me. I need this, Jesus. Did you miss that? I, I was talking kind of fast. Maybe you missed that. And it's us rattling off a laundry list of Jesus, I need, Jesus, I need, Jesus, I need. How many of you know Jesus knows what you need? Jesus knows all about our trouble. He knows everything. He knows all your needs. And guess what? Jesus is on the hook. He takes joy in meeting our needs. But there he, he's under no obligation to meet all your wants. Now, occasionally he'll do that, won't he? Occasionally, there's this desire, and Scripture says that those who delight in him, that he enjoys meeting those desires, and, and he does, and he has. He's done that in my life. He's done that countlessly times in, in your life. But ultimately, he takes care of our needs. And so when we say, or we end a prayer in Jesus' name, it isn't a magical formula, and it doesn't obligate him in, in any way. And so what is it? Why are we doing it? Why do you pray like that? Right? I mean, you know, sometimes we just do stuff and we never think about, why do I say that? Why, why do I do that? And I believe it's absolutely foundational that we, especially, that we know what we're saying when we pray in Jesus' name. Clearly, it was a, a big deal to him. Before he's going to the cross, he is sharing this kind of divine instruction with those that will carry on after him. And so let's talk about what it is. Listen, in Jesus' name is instead an amazing offer based on our relationship with him. It is an offer. It is a benefit. How many of you like benefits? Real, how many real people came to church today? Y'all are thinking about the, the, the hot dogs and hamburgers and, and where you're going to go. Right, look at it. I totally tapped into it. Right? Right? How many of you like benefits? How many of you like benefits? How many of you, when you go to buy a car, you want to know what are all the benefits of this thing? You want to know those things. We love benefits. We love perks. We like all of those things. And one of the greatest benefits that we have as the redeemed is that we can go to him in prayer. That is amazing. Some of you are from religious backgrounds where you had to go to another human being, to another human being to go up to the Father. And, and Scripture makes it emphatically clear 
that Jesus has become our, our supreme high priest. He is our advocate with the Father. He is the right-hand man, if you will, with the Father. And when we pray, we don't have to go to some guy. We can go right to Jesus in Jesus' name. And Jesus has a conversation with the Father. We have an advocate. We've got an attorney 24-7 with God the Father. How you'd say, that's a benefit. That's a benefit. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. You mean I don't have to wait for Father so-and-so to come in? and No, man, just pray, man. You got that guy. You've got him. It's an amazing offer. Did you know that Isaiah 59 verse 2 and John 9 verse 31 tells us that God literally turns his face away from wicked sinners? Doesn't hear them. Turns the other way. Wow. But through Jesus Christ, a relationship with him, listen, he not only listens, he doesn't just tolerate us, he leans in and listens intently. Why? Because we are his kids. Always attentive. Always attentive for the times that we speak with him. See, the disciples had a real relationship with Jesus. And friends, today, let me remind you that through Jesus Christ, we also have a relationship with God. And that can never just fly over our heads. And because of that, he's making this offer to them and he makes this offer to us in jesus name is instead the amazing offer based on our relationship with him i told you man that's what changed my life in eternity is when i figured out when somebody told me in this church that jesus suffered died an excruciating humiliating death so that i could have a relationship with god Man, I grew up thinking, man, no, Jesus suffered, died, an excruciating, humiliating death on a cross so I could be religious, so that I could be a legalist, so that I could determine who's good and who's bad and who's going to heaven and who isn't. I was a little Pharisee with that errant theology. But then somebody in this church, in this church, from this platform, that it's not about you being religious. It's about a relationship. It's about a relationship that Jesus Christ opened for you to have with the Father. And he's not going to put a pistol in the small of your back and make you walk into it or accept it, but know that it's there. And the only way that it's available is because Jesus Christ did what he did for you. Not when you were all shined up, spit-shined and religious, but it was when you were his biggest enemy. I love that, Kurt. It was perfect for this point when we were enemies he died for us and so this is the benefit of that relationship second of all in jesus name is instead listen recognition of christ's authority when we pray in jesus name it is the recognition of christ's authority what are we celebrating today we're celebrating freedom we are celebrating Many, 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 many years ago, on the 4th of July, 1776, 13 colonists, representatives of the colonists, did something incredibly courageous. They signed a document, a document of independence. One of them signed with really, really big letters. He said, man, I want King George III, I want him to be able to see my name without putting his spectacles on. Boy, the courage it took. The courage it took to say we are going to be autonomous from here on. We are going to be on our own. We're not going to live that way anymore. We're not going to be under those mandates anymore. We are going to be our own country. We are having a declaration of independence. And yet when we pray in the name of Jesus, we are declaring not a declaration of autonomy or independence, but a declaration of dependence and inter. Dependence. In other words, when we pray it, we are acknowledging, God, apart from you, we can't do anything. We are absolutely, absolutely not only indebted to you, but we require you, we need you for everything from your hand. Not just the extras, but the day-to-day. -day. We are absolutely dependent, and we recognize the authority of Christ. Thirdly, in Jesus' name is instead submission to Jesus' will. That's where the rubber meets the road here. You ever prayed something over and over? You 
know what, I'm not sure he hears me. He's certainly not answering it. And he's certainly not answering it the way I wish he would answer it. Are you praying for something right now? Maybe you're praying for somebody right now. James, the half-brother of Jesus, the one who is the leader of the Jerusalem church, who writes that great little New Testament book. I love it where he says, and it's so insightful in James 4 and verse 3, he says, when you ask, that sounds like prayer, right? When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with what? Wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James here is saying, hey, let me, let me clue you guys in. Let me ask you a real honest question. What are you praying for? What are you praying for? Are you, are you, are you praying for you? Are you praying that life would get easier for you? Are you, praying as a, are you at the epicenter of, of all of your intercession and time in God's throne room? James here reads everybody's mail when he says, listen, if we're just praying about us, and how my life can get better, and how I can put more money in the bank, how I can put another car in the driveway, and I end it with this fancy, in Jesus' name. James said, "Uh uh-uh. He ain't buying it. Why? Because not only does he hear the words, but he knows the heart. And he knows that ultimately I am at the receiving end of the prayer. And it's ultimately for my comfort. It's ultimately for my pleasure. Does God enjoy giving you those things? Absolutely. What good father wouldn't? And yet, if that's all I'm praying about, easy street, more for me, more for me, James said, that's why. That's why you're not receiving what you're asking for. See, when we pray, we are to to pray in submission to Jesus' will. What did Jesus pray for? Who did Jesus pray for? What's he praying in the garden? Not my will, but thy will be done, right? Who's Jesus praying for? Father, I've come and I've given them this. Now, Father, keep them together. Keep them united. Father, those that are going to hear the message after them, you guys. Father, help, help them to be in us as we are in each other. Father, it's all about the church. It's all about the gospel. It's all about the proliferation of the good news. It's all about... And yet we so often become so myopic. We make it all about us. Submission, submission to Jesus' will. What is his will? How do I know the will of Jesus? Can I, can I not read my Bible? Do I, by keeping my Bible closed, can I know the will of Jesus? See, it all works together. It all works together. Our, our, our time in the Word, our time on our knees, it all works together and coalesces together. How can I know the will of Jesus if I don't know the will of Jesus? And so in Jesus' name is instead, it's submission to Jesus' will. And, and of great importance, lastly, is that in Jesus' name is instead desire for God's glory. Did you catch that? In our text today, Jesus said, why? Why do we do it that way? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Friend, again, that's why we're here. It's to bring glory to God. And our prayers need to to be about bringing glory to God. And so we see when you pray and I pray in Jesus' name, it's not a magic formula. It doesn't obligate him unnecessarily like we could. But instead, it comes as a benefit of the relationship that he hemorrhaged to give us. It's the recognition of his authority over our life 24-7. It's a submission, us, a submission to his will, not our will. And it's a desire ultimately for the glory of God the Father. So we see, listen, that the end of the prayer, the in Jesus' name part, the end of the prayer should shape the entire prayer. The end of the prayer should shape the entire prayer. And the bottom line is that in Jesus' prayers, our prayers, listen, don't miss this. This is what I want you to get today. In Jesus' prayers, our prayers that Jesus himself would pray. We are praying in his name. We are praying in his name. 
through his authority for the things that Jesus would want. Some of you might be wearing a WWJD bracelet. Some of you maybe have a, a fading bumper sticker on the back of your car. Maybe you've got the win after the whole WWJD thing. What would Jesus do? Let me challenge you today to replace that with WWJP, what would Jesus pray? Do your prayers, do my prayers, are, in, are they in the same neighborhood of something that Jesus would pray? Warning. <laughs> Some of you might be saying, wait a minute, I, I was pretty comfortable with my prayers before. Now you're kind of imposing some guidelines and some qualifiers. And does that mean that, man, I need to be more cautious now when I pray? And, and maybe, I'm, maybe I should just play it safe and, and pray little safe prayers. Is that what Jesus wants us to do? Pray little safe prayers. And I believe quite the opposite. I believe here Jesus is giving us heaven's credit card. <laughs> heaven's credit card with a, an unlimited balance. An unlimited credit limit that always swipes, no problems, always swipes in heaven's storehouse. But it comes with a few rules. Jesus said, use it responsibly. Use it responsibly. Don't just always swipe it for your benefit. Swipe it for the gospel's cause. Swipe it for other people. And whatever you do, when you swipe that card, do it all for the glory of God. That's what our prayers need to look like. And friends, those conditions, listen, they are minor compared to the opportunity. Jesus, let me remind you, has given each and every one of us an amazing opportunity today. An amazing opportunity based on our relationship with him. To do what? To exercise our faith. And to do what? Pray great prayers. Pray great prayers that honor a great God and don't insult him. How many of us are praying little puny, wimpy prayers that are pretty predictable? <laughs> but how many of us are really going out on the edge and we are exercising our faith? Why? Because we know how great God is. We've read about him. We read what God can do. We've seen his exploits. We've listened to each other's testimonies. We serve a great God. We have grabbed a tiger by the tail here. And we in the body of Christ are praying little prayers, predictable prayers. Now, well, God, if you want to, prayers. And here he is giving us carte blanche. This is how I want you to pray. I want you to honor me with your prayers. Friends, we at New Beginnings Christian Church, we need to pray big prayers. We need to pray audaciously faithful prayers. And as long as there is an empty row here, and the end of that row over there, and row back there empty, and over back there, those room are, we need to be praying big, big prayers. Because in every one of those need to be somebody who meets Jesus Christ. Because to not know Jesus... To not know Jesus is the biggest tragedy anybody can encounter. Worse than poverty, worse than heartache, is an eternal separation from a holy God unnecessarily. Friends, we need to be praying big prayers. Well, you know what? When, when everything looks like it's kind of predictable, then we'll pray this very, very nice postured prayer with a bunch of these and thous. You know, I think he likes it when we pepper it with that. But are we willing to pray audaciously faith prayers? Prayers that other people say, what? Did you just pray? Do you believe that this God is big? Do you believe that this God is powerful? Do you believe this God is faithful? Do you believe if we put his glory, if we put his will at the forefront... I believe scripture says that, that God loves everyone. He's patient with all of us, wanting all people to be saved means we got to pray, guys. That means we need to be praying big, big, great prayers, prayers that honor a great God and don't insult him. Are you praying? Are you praying great prayers? Prayer is not about getting our agenda in heaven. 
Prayer is about getting God's agenda on earth through us. That's it. That's what prayer is all about. Not gimme, 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 my name's Jimmy. It's about God's will. Let it be done on earth as it is in. Let it be done on as it is in. Let it be done here as it is in heaven. We got to pray. We got to pray big prayers. Back to my question. If you knew God could answer your prayer 100% guaranteed, what would you pray for? What are you praying for? According to Jesus in our text this morning, there are those classification of prayers. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, forgive us. We're not trusting you more. Father, forgive us for making our prayers about us, our comfort, our pleasures, instead about your agenda, your news, your salvation, what you're offering every member of the human family. Father, I pray that our prayers would not insult you but, Father, that our prayers would honor you. That, Lord, that we would pray with greater vigor. We'd pray with greater greater consistency. Lord, that we would pray that your will would be done. We pray just as Jesus were praying, that, Father, that we would be praying for your glory and your will to take traction in Tampa, in Tampa Bay and beyond. Father, we thank you. Forgive us, Lord, for the wimpy prayers we pray. Father, I pray for greater faith. I pray for greater faith in our prayers. And that, Father, when we pray in Jesus' name, that you would hear those prayers. And that, Father, that you would answer them. Not from hearts that want more for us, but prayers that of hearts that want more for your name and renown. Father, I pray this prayer with my friends today in Jesus' name.